Hello, everyone. Um, as was mentioned, my name is Colin Cavodi. I am a junior in Drexel's custom design major, which means I get to study whatever I want. Uh, that freedom gives me the space to pursue my dreams as uh, I've laid them out for the past few years. And so my goal today is to share that story with you and how that relates to the world. Um, I have a bunch of pictures that I'm going to share with you, some quotes, and since this is a story, I'm going to kind of read it to you. Uh, at 18 years old, I was in college studying entrepreneurship. Like a lot of new college students, I was in a period of exceptional growth, learning about myself and how I fit in with the world. Yet I grew uncomfortable with what I saw. The world I was growing up in seemed flawed. Everywhere I looked, I saw humanity mismanaging the planet we live upon and the resources which surround us. Resource extraction, excessive consumption, pollution, and wastefulness. As a business student, I felt personally accountable to not perpetuate those practices. I didn't want to be part of the problem, and so I stopped. After finishing my spring semester at Temple, I moved to the beach for five months, and I thought about what life meant to myself. No one had the answers at that time, so I had to set out my own plan. I would go wherever I needed to learn more about how to live in harmony with nature. After six months of working and planning, I boarded a train at 30th Street Station, right here in Philadelphia, and traveled across the North American continent. Once in Seattle, I chartered a seaplane, which majestically delivered me to a small island where I would live for the next four months. I threw out my cell phone and gave my iPod away. I didn't have a laptop, and I had no connection to the technological world, which we're all talking about today. I was taught to gather wild food from the forests, prairies, and oceans, and many of my days were spent lying on a remote pebbled beach. It was here that I continued my thinking about what sustainability actually meant. Even during these serene moments, I was reminded of our modern world. Along the horizon, out where the Pacific Ocean begins, I could watch as tankers full of crude oil passed in front of me. I was a constant reminder that the world was not where it needs to be. Back at the homestead, I adjusted to life without plumbing. During these months, I labored on organic farms, rehabbed and lived aboard a sailboat, and shared time with amazing travelers who also sought harmonious living. While romantic sounding, taking myself to so foreign a place was a struggle for my body, mind, and spirit. What was I doing? Was I doing enough? What would I do next? As the summer wound down, I found myself ready to move on, but not sure where. I learned a vital lesson in those months, that while I may live a sustainable life, the world still wasn't. On another journey, I moved to the Ozark Mountains of rural Arkansas. In a small county where the US Census has never shown its face, I apprenticed one of the country's premier wood-fired ceramic potters. So isolated was this place that six miles of dirt road had to be traversed in order to get to the first paved street. After that, 30 minutes of driving to get to any sign of commerce. It was during one of our trips to town, Walmart, to buy groceries, that I had an evolution of my thoughts. As the old pickup truck hummed along the dirt road, I noticed a fairly modern bridge in the distance, and I thought, that bridge, that big bridge, that's man-made. That's clearly a man-made thing. And then, behind that yet was an even bigger structure, a mountain, and I thought, wow, that majestic mountain, that's natural, nature made that. But then as years of culturally instilled beliefs faded away, I realized that humans are natural. We belong here. For a while, I didn't believe that. We seem like more of a cancer upon this planet. Yet surely this is our home, and we do belong here, and thus everything we do is totally natural. The issue is that so far humanity has conducted itself in a way which tries to usurp nature, profit from nature, all while continually marginalizing nature. But this makes sense. For virtually all of human history, nature has been the one marginalizing us. With industrialization, with the help of science and technology, we think we can tame nature. We can extract resources and turn them into amazing products. The problem with all this, though, is that so far we haven't thought through the whole process. The problem is that old school industrialization 
and high growth economics have provided humans with amazing material wealth at the expense of the future, the whole system is short sighted and we must rethink how we do things. We must learn how to meet our current needs without limiting the ability for the future to meet their own needs. Fast forward and I'm working at a kid's summer camp in the US Virgin Islands. On one of these small islands in the Western Hemisphere's second largest oil refinery, I spent a month teaching kids how to reconnect with their own native environment. This gargantuan piece of engineering which processed crude oil from all around the world was a constant reminder that humanity is still on the fast track toward self-destruction. On the island, a wise and gracious woman told me that it's time I return to school, and somewhere deep down, I knew she was right. But what would I study after having spent years charting my own path? I knew it involved sustainability, but I was weary of entering a highly structured program. I wanted to attend a university that trusted in my ability to continue charting my own course. So here I am at Drexel. As one of 25 students in the custom major, I have freedom to draw from all courses across Drexel's colleges. And since I don't have typical required courses, that means a lot of freedom. And this freedom, like I said earlier, gives me the opportunity to continue my mission towards a sustainable future. In the way that I see fit, that's the key part. It's a very American idea. I think empowering students to charter their own course in school is a vital component to the future. Each of us has amazing talents and unique insights, yet left unnurtured, we become people who are living someone else's vision. I wager that it's a vision of the past, of the old way of doing things. Let me explain a little more. There we go. Ever since industrialization, humanity has been beating its drum in the name of progress, bigger, stronger, faster, more, more, more. We all know it, we all feel it every day when we wake up. That process, having been repeated for generations and now spread into new, underdeveloped countries, has brought us to a precarious point. The old way of doing things is getting no further. It's getting us no further. The linear way of thinking is now at its end, and if we keep going, we will all likely have an inhospitable planet to live on. But that's the good news. It means we can avoid that option. Keep going back. There we go. One step forward is for our universities to transform their curriculum. I want to quote one of my sources of inspiration, Ray Anderson. In the 1950s, before sustainability was really on the radar, he inspired his entire company to confront sustainability. He thought it a moral obligation at first, but soon realized that if he redirected his business towards resource efficiency, he would make more money. And he did, and a lot more money. So he proved that sustainability is good for business. His quote continues where I left off regarding education. Teaching students about internal combustion engines and cold-fired power plants is to prepare them for an outdated world. In the old world, civil engineers would be taught how to build a bridge stronger, lighter, more resistant to wind and weather. In the future, we will teach engineers to ask whether the bridge ought to be built at all. That paradigm shift is about future, conscious, interdisciplinary problem solving. And as a species, we no longer have the space and freedom to keep asserting ourselves and our grand plans over top of nature. We must acknowledge the negative ways we affect this planet, and the bridge we must now build will require the evolution of business, industry, education, and yes, yourself. In the future, the winners will be people and institutions which understand that we have but one planet. The better we can understand and function with those limited resources, the better off we will be. And I just want to leave you with one current project that I'm working on in my program. Uh, I'm working with an amazing biologist to better understand how plants absorb carbon dioxide directly out of the air. Most of you realize, I'm sure, that, the, that humans have put way too much carbon dioxide into the air, into the atmosphere. But right now, there's no viable plans of how to get that out. That means more shifting weather, hotter and drier summers, acidifying oceans, rising sea level, spreading of deserts, and those are just the things we anticipate. But what if we could capture that carbon 
What if cities, municipalities, and corporations invested in infrastructure which actually reverse the effects of climate change? Before winter, I will be testing plant species for just that purpose. In the next year, I will refine, manufacture, market, and sell a product which uses plants to help us outthink climate change. And now I marvel at humans because I realize that we can outthink ourselves from our own past. Thank you.